I'm so glad you all are here on such a rainy afternoon. You know, it's a, it's a testament to your commitment and to excellent programming. Um, because Rashad Shabazz is a fabulous uh, youngish scholar. <laughs> He's moving up in the age ranks. Uh, <laughs> um, who we're very delighted to have here. For those of you who aren't in um, Professor Block's class or in my class, um, this is a collaboration between, I guess, Urban Studies and the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and any number of other co-sponsors that we were able to gather along the way. Um, professor Shabazz is Associate Professor at the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. And um, he's uh, got a tremendous academic expertise bringing together human geography, black cultural studies, gender studies, and critical prison studies. And his research, as you'll hear, explores how race, sexuality, and gender are informed by geography. And he will speak from his new work, which is wonderful, called Spatializing Blackness, which examines how the carceral power within the geographies of black Chicagoans shaped urban planning, housing policy, uh, policing practices, gang formation, high incarceration rates, masculinity, and health. His work has appeared in a number of, of peer-reviewed journals, including Souls, the Spatial Justice Journal, Acme, Gender Place, and Culture and Occasions, and has published several book chapters and book reviews. And he's working on two new projects as well. But the most important thing about Rashad is that uh, he and I shared a graduate student professor relationship at Santa Cruz before I came back to Brown. And we, oh, part of a cohort of people, we had a very fun time um, teaching, have, you know, just sort of tearing it up in the woods in California, because <laughs> Santa Cruz is truly in the woods. Um, but I'm very glad that we found a way to bring him back uh, here. And I look forward to hearing his talk tonight. Please join me in welcoming Rashad Shabazz. Thank you. Trisha, can you hear me OK? Uh, so Trisha also, she failed to mention that she served on my dissertation committee. I TA'd for her. I took classes with her. So um, it's a real honor to, to be uh, back with you after nine years. I haven't seen you in nine years. So, so yes, we're, we're aging gracefully. Um, uh, I, I want to I thank uh, Tricia and uh, Stefano for bringing me out, as, as well as the Center for um, uh, Race and Ethnicity. Well, uh, I also want to thank everybody for, for coming out tonight on this first rainy day, is what I heard, uh, of the, the fall semester. So uh, kudos to you all. And uh, I hope to give you an engaging and thoughtful lecture. So I'm going to talk about my research broadly. I'm going to speak specifically about one of the chapters uh, from my book, in Spatializing Blackness. I'm going to talk about the, the implications that it has for very pressing political problems that we are dealing with in the contemporary. And I'm also going to take just a, a minute to talk about the research that is ongoing. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, here we go. So this talk tonight is about how carceral power became a permanent fixture in black Chicago in the early part of the 20th century. But telling this story really requires to talk about the obsession that Chicago had over black, white, interracial, social, and sexual spaces in the early part of the 20th century. And in doing so, these, these spaces of interaction became permanent fixtures in Chicago. In doing this, uh, in, in speaking about this point, I wanted to talk specifically about police. Policing the Black Belt, which was a body of real estate on the south side of Chicago that was roughly about a mile wide and about four miles long is where the overwhelming majority of black Chicagoans in the early and mid part of the 20th century lived. Um, in talking about police power with respect to the black belt, I'm going to talk about how police power was installed into the black community in the early part of the 20th century and the reasons why it emerged. Between 1890 and 1930, a shift took place regarding tolerance over vice districts. You all know what vice districts are. Places where there's gambling, prostitution, alcohol. 
during that time, vice went from being a tolerated and even celebrated social function into being a moral scourge. What happened in just these 20 years where tolerance, where vice went from being tolerated to being outlawed? And how did this impact the life of black Chicagoans? That is going to be the subject of my talk tonight. Let's see, is this working? All right, okay. So, um, so let me say a little bit about my academic background. So I'm a, I'm a geographer, and you know, geographers do more than just look at maps. Any, any geographers? Is there a geography program here? Man, see, this is the problem. Like, geography just gets like, treated like the, the stepchild of the academy. Um, uh, geographers do a lot of things, right? So, you know, and I, I assume most of you haven't taken a geography class since you were in like fifth grade. But what geographers do is we look at the relationship between human beings and place. So whether that be about the impact human beings are having on the environment that is causing you know, all of the environmental degradation that we're seeing, or if it's about the ways in which forms of police power manifest themselves in particular geographies and what that, ha what that means in terms of mobility, criminalization, high arrest and incarceration rates. This is what geographers do. And one of my favorite thinkers of space, uh, who never claimed himself to be a geographer, but, but nevertheless contributed much to the field, was Michel Foucault. I'm sure you all have heard of him before. You've read him. You think of him as a philosopher, maybe a sociologist, a kind of weird historian. But toward the end of his life, uh, Foucault spent a lot of time with geographers, and he was really fascinated with the relationship between the exercise of power and place. And so this is really one of my favorite quotes of his, where he argues that space is fundamental to any exercise of power. Chicago, like many northern cities at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, had a robust vice district. It was called the Levee. The Levee is a 20 square block area between Halstead and LaSalle streets on the city's south side, bulging with pool halls, saloons, and numerous houses of prostitution. The, the Levee became the city's best known vice district against the backdrop of reformers' efforts and the ultimate success to close down uh, districts like the Levee, vice, particularly uh, prostitution, has uh, ballooned in new areas. So it's sort of that, that that notion of when you, when you squeeze a balloon, it, the air fills somewhere else, that's pretty much what happened with respect to the Levee. The Black Belt was the primary place that Vice migrated to. So basically on this map, I'm a geographer, we have to pull out maps. Um, basically, uh, uh, to my left is the, is the Black Belt. And so the Levee was situated uh, directly south of the Black Belt. Uh, in the Black Belt, a new form of vice emerged. And this new form of vice uh, happened in these places called black and tans, or cafes. And this new form of vice had everything to do with the ways in which blacks and whites began to interact socially and sexually in these locations. Dancing, music, oops, sorry. Uh, dancing, music, drinking, interracial socializing were the cornerstones of these new places. They were called black and tans. This combustible mixture was seen as an indication of, of immorality and sexual deviance. The, a Chicago Daily Tribune uh, described black and tans seen this way, quote, all tables were filled at 2 a.m., black men with white girls, white men with yellow girls, old and young, filled with abandonment, brought together by illicit whiskey, music, uh, by illicit whiskey and liquor music." End quote. I love that quote. Many po uh, made popular at the beginning of the 20th century by young whites attracted to popular dance halls that tolerated interracial socializing, black and tans quickly became emblematic of racial and sexual deviance in the city of Chicago. These young middle class whites that visited the black and tans found the quote, primitive and lascivious libidinal atmosphere of these establishments allowed them to express sexuality in ways that were often incongruent with their middle class values. <clears throat> 
Of all the cities in the Midwest at the turn of the century, Chicago was known for its race mixing. Noted one Baltimore African, New Baltimore Afro-American newspaper writer. Because, the city, uh, because of the fame the city gained from it, interracial sex created much consternation and fascination among the public. The ultimate expulsion of spaces of inter interracial intimacy from the public and the sequestering them within black communities tells us much about the impact race and sexuality had on the construction of Chicago's geography. Moreover, it highlights the entry point for the exercise of carceral power in black Chicago. So again, thinking back to that quote from Michel Foucault. Now, if I were to choose a day for the emergence of carceral power in black Chicago, I would choose July 14th, 1917. On that day, Sergeant Stanley J. Burris was killed in a shootout on Chicago's Southside Black, uh, South Black Vice District. The violent altercation began when a gunman intent on killing the, the police inspector of morals, which was a morals committee that was put together to, to undermine and to destroy uh, all kinds of vice, but particularly black, white, interracial vice, uh, was, was killed in a shooting. When the bullets finally stopped, Sergeant Burris lay dead and three others were wounded. In the immediate aftermath, in the immediate aftermath, German-born Captain Max Newtbar was appointed head of the 22nd Police District, which housed both the Levy, this place, uh, and the Black Belt. Newtbar had a unique assignment. In the wake of the violence, he was assigned to, quote, clean up the Levy, end quote. To do this, Newt Barr used police power in the form of arrest, surveillance, and issuing police orders. Nicknamed the human lid, Newt Barr worked to put a stranglehold on vice by closing down well-known establishments, increasing the number of police in the precinct, and expanding the rest of people suspected of being involved in vice. From now on, said the captain, the lid on the old red light district will be nailed down tight, and it's going to stay nailed down tight as long as, I'm, as I am in command here. Now, Newt Barr's use of police tactics to suppress vice were not new. Since the late 19th century, police and vice have been linked. But what separated Newt Barr was that rather than using police power to to enable vice, which had been done throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, what Newt Barr did is he used police power to shut down and to undermine vice. For Newt Barr, however, police power but would not be used to protect vice, but rather stamp it out. In his first act, Captain Newt Barr ordered one of his sergeants to close down a club where the shooting uh, that I've mentioned before occurred, the Onion Cafe. What separated Newt Barr from other commanders uh, that police vice was that he viewed mice as a moral affront to the standards of decency and purity. Whereas other commanders tolerated it, even squeezed gaff from it, Newt Barr did not. His objective was to close them down once and for all. As a result, he, he approached policing differently. Rather than tacit acceptance and soft policing, Newt Barr's tactics were aggressive, even radical. For example, during his tenure as commander, Newt Barr expanded the size of the police force in his district, closed hotels and dance, dance halls that shielded prostitution, raided bars suspected of gambling and disobeying the 1 a.m. liquor law. He arrested immoral women, he, he chased out panhandlers, sequestered Johns, and, police, uh, and had police officers canvass the homes of thousands of residents in the Black Belt looking for those who violated vice laws. Amid the new powers granted him by the Anti-Vice Committee of 15, Newt Barr greatly extended the powers of police in his district. Newt Barr, however, did not have equal distaste for all vice. The form of vice that disgusted him more than any was the interracial socializing, dancing, and sex which was taking place in the black and tan cabarets on the south side in the black belt. For Newt Barr, black and tans were an affront to the morality of white women and a crucifixion of whiteness. In the fall of 1917, Newt Barr was embroiled in a controversy concerning a black and tan cabaret. Three years after his promotion, 
the, cab the celebrated captain stood before the police board on charges of having violated state law by issuing an order to forbid social intermingling between whites and blacks in a Southside cafe. Captain Newtbar shut down the cafe and issued a police order against black white socializing, drinking, and dancing. According to Newtbar, the order was issued, quote, to clean up the vice conditions in the cafes and cabarets, end quote. When asked about the charges, Newtbar argued, quote, and you can read the quote behind me, I believe I had a legitimate right when young white girls were found dancing and drinking with Negro men in, uh, to issue an order to stop this on the grounds that such places that places which per, that permitted such things were disorderly. No place is reputable when young white girls are allowed to drink and dance with Negro men. I maintain that no white woman is respectable that goes to a place like the Onion Cafe. The commander, the captain punctuated his comments by saying, quote, I would shoot my wife and daughter if I found them in such a place, end quote. Now, Captain Newtbar's use of police, of po police power to interrupt the social interaction between blacks and whites in the Southside Cafe is really a portal into understanding the deployment and exercise of carceral power in Chicago in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, 20th century. Issuing the order criminalized black communities, particularly sex across the color line. And it reinforced socio-spatial boundaries between blacks and whites. Issuing the order also helped to shore up and to consolidate European ethnic identity into expanding for Europeans only, and, and we can talk about that during the Q&A, uh, racial configuration of whiteness. Policing helped Newt Barr, a first generation immigrant from Germany, sure up his own racial identity by placing boundaries around white women and using policing as the tool to do so newt Barr was able to shed his ethnic identity and enter whiteness this point is de is painfully demonstrated by the use of police power to separate blacks and whites in the public sphere the order newt Barr issued was the tipping point indeed the beginning of the centering of police power in the quotidian space of blacks. So the way I like to give my talks is I like to be like, uh, like any good MC should be. Like, you know, any good MC, she should be able to like, you know, write her lyrics down and read them in the microphone and do her thing. And she's got to be able to freestyle. All right, that's, that's, that's the mark of any good MC. So I'm going to do that for a little while. So let me talk a little about the, the geography of social space uh, on the, the south side of Chicago. And this is just a, a newspaper article about, um, uh, about Newt Barr. So what we have in the early part of the 20th century is this really interesting, robust social space where blacks and whites are coming together in these underground nightclubs. And it's, you know, they're filled with jazz music. It, this is also during the time of prohibition, so there's alcohol. And we see that in these places, all of these ideas, these fantasies, these desires around blackness, whiteness, Asianness as well, are being played out in these spaces. And what we begin to see is that the state has deep anxiety about the existence of these places. The state has anxiety for a couple of reasons. One, they're concerned about the very existence of them. Social spaces where blacks and whites and other people of color engage in social interaction, dancing, and sometimes sex. The other anxiety they have is what would happen? What are the implications if the social and sexual politics of the spaces such as the black and tans spill over into the everyday geography of the city? How does a city that is really deeply organized along racial lines, how does it maintain those racial boundaries if, they are, if there are numerous social spaces that are existing, particularly on the south side of Chicago, where we see the, the inverse of this, where we see blacks, whites, and other people engaging in social and sexual interactions? Now, because these nightclubs existed underground, away from the eyes of neighbors, parents, young, uh, neighbors and parents, young whites who really began to fuel 
the, um, uh, the popularity of these places outside of black communities, um, they begin to sort of challenge these dominant notions of sexual respectability. In spite of the politics of cross-racial interaction that happened within black and tans, they, they ultimately serve to reinscribe racial, racial hegemony. Slumming, which is the term that these became known as, oh, I forgot to, to mention this, just to give you all a sense of where we're talking about here. So this is the, uh, this is the, the, the black belt, and as you can see, this is the, uh, the organization of uh, black geographic life in the city. And if I could just sort of uh, give a caveat as to why this existed. Early part of the 20th century, as black people began to move up from the south to the north, they confronted these things called racial restrictive covenants. And I'm sure taking classes from both uh, Professor Roge and Professor Block, you all have read about this. But these were legally binding documents within the contract law and deed of houses, apartments, that said who could live there. No blacks, no Jews, no Chinese, but particularly no blacks. So what we began to see is that 85% of the housing market in Chicago was governed by racially restrictive covenants, which meant that 15% of the housing market, 15% of the geography of the city was open to black people living there. And this is why we see this, this stretch of land on the south side, which has became known as the Black Belt. You can also see a smaller one on the west side and another smaller one uh, on the farther south side. But the overwhelming majority of them lived in this small piece of real estate on the south side. OK, so back to slumming. So slumming it in black and tans um, enabled whites to put on public display alternative forms of sexuality made possible by the liberties afforded them by being white in a culture that saw their sexuality as normal. And this is really important because what we began to see in these black and tans is that, you know, despite the fact that they're challenging these dominant notions of the racial and sexual logic that exist broadly within this context, where you see blacks being situated spatially in this location, whites having access to all of the other housing networks, right? So we, what we basically see is the sort of carving up or the spatialization of race in the city. Ultimately, slumming it reinscribed these dominant notions about black sexuality. They, they reinscribed this notion that black sexuality was aberrant, different, and non-normative, and that whites who participated in what was going on in these black and tans were simply sort of playing out whatever fantasies. They were slumming for the night or for the week. They were you know, participating in this non-normative form of sexual practice, but ultimately that they would have and lead normative, normal sexual lives. And these were sort of stages uh, in, you know, young whites' development. So a major part of the black and tans was that as black and tans became more and more popular throughout the 1930s and 40s, the police presence began to intensify. Newt Barr wanted to get rid of the black and tans. Again, he saw them as an affront to whiteness, as an affront to respectability, and so he wanted to do whatever he could to erase them from the landscape. But they were deeply embedded into the black belt, and they were in these underground places. So part of what Newt Barr was able to do, with the help of the Committee of 15, as well as the, the political networks of Chicago, was that he was able to devise a series of police tactics to grapple with, to destroy, and to undermine black and tans. And these were things like developing a database of, of Johns and sex workers, expanding the number of police officers in the police force, redistricting the precinct that he was the head of. And that redistricting effort, if I could just go back to this, but that, that, that redistricting really expanded throughout his tenure 
into the Black Belt. It was largely in the sort of downtown district, which is just, just north of the, the, the tip of that Black Belt. Is there a? Is there a no, it's not a, um, a pointer. No pointer. Uh, which is just north of the, the Black Belt. But instead, what, what he was able to do was he was able to expand the entire network of policing down throughout the body of the Black Belt. So what we began to see is that by the 1930s, police officers are knocking on black community members' doors, arresting black people on the south side of Chicago, moving police power into the everyday quotidian geography of people in the Black Belt. And this is, what, this is the, the beginning of the 1930s. Now, Newt Barr's dis disgust over interracial sex wasn't solely about his own personal ideas. Right? This wasn't you know, Newt Barr's personal crusade. Newt Barr's ideas were really deeply reinforced by a set of ideas that began to emerge really in the latter part of the 19th century. And they migrated up with black people as they began to move from the south to the north. At the end of, at the end of slavery, we begin to see this fundamentally different way of thinking about and understanding black sexuality. Throughout the period of slavery, black sexuality was seen as childish as having very little agency. But in the years after slavery, during emancipation, and particularly during Reconstruction, we begin to see black sexuality, particularly black male sexuality, that gets projected as violent, as, as in need of a check and a regulation. And we begin to see that throughout the 1880s, 1890s throughout the Reconstruction period, we see the rise of white supremacy in the South. And that white supremacy manifests itself in terms of organizations like the Klan, but it also manifests itself in very specific kinds of geographic forms of order. We begin to see the carving up of the everyday geography of southern cities and towns that manifests itself in a variety of anti-miscegenation laws all throughout the South, where it becomes illegal to marry across the color line. Moreover, we began to see the carving up of the everyday geography of Southern cities and towns in terms of where black people can go to school, where black people can swim, doors they can enter into, libraries they can go into what one scholar calls throughout, the, throughout the, the period of reconstruction in the early 20th century, we see the rise of the geography of white supremacy, where the entire spatial order of the South gets organized around racial lines. Now, as black people began to leave the South in the years right around the First World War, in large numbers, the great black migration, which you have all, I'm sure, read about and heard and thought a lot about. As black people began to leave the South and move north, these various discourses about the sexual pathology, the violence, the criminality that become attached to blackness in those years after emancipation move with them. And they're reinforced most thoroughly by scholars. Frederick Hoffman was a statistician, and he was actually a statistician for an um, insurance company. He was a statistician and a social scientist at the end of the uh, 19th century. And in the early part of the 20th century, he wrote a book, Race Traits and the Tendencies of the American Negro. Now, uh, this book was a very popular book 
Hoffman went from city to city, university to university, all up and down the East Coast. He was at Princeton. He spoke at the University of Vermont. He spoke at uh, Columbia. And the thesis in the book was twofold. One is that he had an extinction thesis. He said that because of the, the biological nature of black people that they would not be able to survive the rigors of life in the early part of the 20th century. That really by the mid 20th century, most black people would die off. The second, and I think most important thesis, was that he argued that black people were predestined and biologically prone to criminality and sexual deviance. And his major thesis in this book was that as black people migrated from the south to the north during the years between the First and Second World War, that cities needed to do everything they could to brace themselves for the onslaught of criminality <coughs> and sexual deviance that would move from the south to the north. So we have Hoffman making this claim in addition to thousands of newspapers, magazine articles that talk specifically about the implications of black people moving up to northern cities like Boston, New York, Philly, Chicago, Oakland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And all of these cities responded in relatively similar ways, which was effectively to create racialized geographies. In the early part of the 20th century, one of the dominant ways of organizing the city was not through transportation, was not through access to resources, but it was really about organizing the city around race. Blacks would live here, the Chinese would live here, and whites would live here. And that social and spatial organization would have deep and lasting implications that really manifest themselves to this current moment. And so let's go back to Hoffman. So Hoffman makes this claim that cities need to brace themselves for the migration of black people from the south to the north. And, and it is precisely at this moment where the city of Chicago is grappling with what to do with these black and tans, what to do with these social spaces of interracial interaction and the anxieties that those spaces produced and the implications they would have as more and more blacks came from the south to the north. Would blacks, particularly black men, was the real anxiety, would black men feel that what happened in the social space of the black and tans was acceptable on an everyday street? And what would that mean in terms of the spatial organization of the city? So what cities like Chicago and crusaders like Hoffman, uh, like uh, Newt Barr began to do was they began to deploy police power as a way of not only organizing the racial geography of the city, but also to police the boundaries between black Chicago and white Chicago. So by the 1930s, we began to see a fundamental shift occurring. <coughs> Police power by this time has moved into black communities. But black communities also played a role in that movement. Despite Hoffman's desire to expand the precinct, create more, create these tactics for police power, put more officers on the street, black communities also played a role in that expansion. And that expansion was organized primarily along class lines. Poor and working class blacks in Chicago 
did not see or want any more police intervention in their communities. Many saw the police as, at best, a nuisance, and at worst, terror. But the black middle class had a very different way of seeing it. The black middle class saw police as a way to absolve and to push away claims of black sexual pathology and black criminality. The logic was, if the black middle class, or if we black folks, brought police power into the community, we can demonstrate to the larger white society that we, A, care about law and order, we care about crime, and we can demonstrate to them that we are upwardly mobile citizens who deserve and should have access to full citizenship. Police power became this, this sort of uh, odd way of the black middle class in Chicago of getting access to the forms of full citizenship that they were denied. And they were denied these largely because, exclusively, because of race. Race began to sort of shape the, the, the everyday dynamics of how the black middle class began to see their relationship to policing. So rather than tolerate the sexual dynamic that was happening in black and tans, black middle class asked for them to be ousted. And they built an alliance with the police. They effectively built a, um, what, we, what is akin to a kind of uh, sexual policing. And they brought police in. They asked community members to participate, to give up johns, to give up sex workers, to tell people where, to tell police where these underground nightclubs were. And when this happens in the mid-1930s, police power becomes a permanent and enduring presence in black Chicago. Once, these, once police power moves in, it stays. And in very much, uh, and in very much the ways that uh, Hoffman would have argued that this is the necessary way to protect, to create lines, to create boundaries between blacks and whites in the city, was police power. So carceral power moves into black Chicago not as a response to, to criminality, but as a response to fear, as a response to anxiety, as a way of policing racial and sexual boundaries. And the implications are significant. When police power moves in, it stays. And as we move forward into the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that carceral network, the mechanisms of policing, surveillance, and containment get woven into the everyday geographies of black communities. So policing is just one of many. By the 40s and 50s, with the rise of housing projects, we began to see the encroachment of carceral power in other ways, not just in terms of policing, but architecture. Housing projects, or post-war housing projects, are built in the years right after the Second World War. This is the Robert Taylor Housing Project. For a while, it was the biggest housing project in the world. It housed roughly around 25, 26,000 people. They're, uh, they're grouped in threes. They, they're, they're all along the south side corridor. Any, anybody in here from, the, from Chicago? Any Chicagoans in here? Where are you from? You, where, where, where are the south side? Rose, oh, you're from Roseland? Oh my God, I, I, I'm from uh, right, over, right over by Roseland, 103rd. So, it's Chicago. Um, so, uh, this, if I can actually go back, that housing project uh, 
is on state, was on State Street. So on the right side of this map, in the years right after the Second World War, housing projects were built exclusively in black communities all over the country. And they are built, oh, sorry, sorry. Hold on, let me go back. Uh, and they're built in black communities because whites, white communities did everything they could to keep them out, right? Not only using uh, political mechanisms in the case of uh, Daly in Chicago, but they also used violence, straight mob violence to keep out any and all prospects of public housing. So these housing projects were built and they were, they were really built as most uh, post-World War House, post-World War II housing projects as a response to the awful crisis of the <coughs> tenements. In Chicago, they were called kitchenettes, and kitchenettes were basically, actually, I have a picture of them. Do I have a picture of them? I don't have a picture of them. Uh, kitchenettes were um, extremely small, cramped forms of housing that existed in the Black Belt. They were rented, they were, in, they were rooms that were rented out to entire families. So instead of having uh, a two-bedroom apartment that was lived in by two or three people, an entire family would live in a kitchenette. All right, so you have one family living in one room, another family living in another room, and then you would have maybe a family living in the, uh, in the living room, and they were called kitchenettes because they had these little uh, kitchenette units that was uh, basically a hot plate and, a, and, uh, and, and an ice box. All right, and if any of you have read uh, Richard Wright's uh, Native Son, he writes brilliantly about him. And I really argue that you know, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of the way in which we can understand and think about Bigger Thomas is, is uh, largely um, shaped by that kitchenette unit. But these housing units were created, public housing was really created as a response to the housing crisis that was created in black cities, that was created in northern cities in large part because, because cities had these restrictive covenants that wouldn't allow black people to move around. So housing, public housing emerges as a response and public housing was for a period of time some of the best housing you could get in the city. They were roomy, they were new, they were affordable, they were well kept. But by the end of the, by the middle part of the 1960s when the post-war economy wears off, you know, that economy that <coughs> pretty much sort of creates the, the, the modern notion of the middle class, that industrial economy that was, uh, that was really organized around industrial labor, union guaranteed work, decent wages. When that economy disappears in the middle part of the 1960s, Places like Robert Taylor housing projects experience crisis. So you have the people who are already caught between the realities of racism and poverty on one hand, but then when the economic basis that funds the, the, the continuance of these projects disappears, you have instability that emerges through poverty. And in the state of Illinois, and in many of, the, many of the states around the country, the federal government responds to this crisis not through things like job programs or education or even compassion or empathy. The way that the federal government responds was through policing or the deployment of these carceral mechanisms. So what we begin to see is that the federal government shifts its funding away from upkeep of facilities, programming, repairs, and shifts it towards security. By the mid to late 1960s, cages are put over them. By the early 1970s, turnstiles, you know what a turnstile is, you walk in, it spins around. <coughs> turnstiles are put in the lobbies, surveillance equipment, police officers, on-site court systems, as well as bulletproof and plexiglass deployed into the everyday living space of 
poor working class black Chicagoans. And so what we're beginning to see here is that in the early part of the 20th century, we see the encroachment and deployment of policing into the everyday geographies of black folks. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, we began to see the deployment of surveillance equipment, police officers, containment mechanisms, gates, chain link fences. And so this has deep and profound implications for understanding the contemporary moment. Mass incarceration, which begins really around 1972 and just explodes throughout the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and the contemporary to create what we have right now, which is about 2.3 million people in prison and something like 7.5 million under the jurisdiction of the state. has a much longer history. You know, it wasn't just about that moment in 1973. And if any of you have seen the, the uh, 13th, which is a great documentary, actually my students in my class, uh, because I wasn't there, they watched it today, so they got to sit home and, you know, watch Netflix instead of uh, going to class. I mean, it's a really powerful documentary. But what it doesn't take into account is how these mechanisms of contain and constraint and policing and surveillance have been part of the everyday quotidian reality of black geographies for decades. We see it in Chicago in the early part of the 20th century. It moves in under this anxiety, this fear about sex across the color line, the movement of black people from the north to the south, from the south to the north, and how cities would respond to it. And so if we want to really grapple with the reality of mass incarceration, we have to first understand how these practices were embedded into the everyday place that, black, that poor and working class black folks have lived in. So how do we respond to this in the contemporary? How do we push back against these long histories of the deployment of carceral power into the everyday geographies of black folks? Well, here's one of the things that I write about in my book, and it's happening right now in Chicago. Um, so, and I'll, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying um, I, am, I am not the, uh, I'm probably one of the most nature averse people um, y'all will meet. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a green thumb, you know, tree hugging kind of person. That being said, one of the ways that black folks in Chicago are reimagining and remaking these landscapes that have been deeply infused with carceral power is through greening these spaces and creating spaces of agricultural production, particularly in what, are, what geographers call the sort of idle or dead spaces. And this is why this is important. Most cities over the last 20 years have decided to deal with poverty and instability by simply moving people out. Brooklyn. I know there's some people in here from Brooklyn. All right. Brooklyn is, is probably, you know, the, the gentrification capital of North America. I mean, you can't walk around Brooklyn without, like, beards, <laughs> craft pickles, you know, I mean, I mean, damn, they got a basketball team. 30 years ago, would have never thought about that. There's a basketball team in Brooklyn, and I hear that they're supposed to get a, a hockey franchise, is the, is the word on the street. But, but moving people out has been the way to deal with poverty and instability. Chicago has been doing this for the last 20 years. And poor working class folks may not have economic mobility, but they do possess the ways 
to recreate their landscapes and to create landscapes that can be productive for them both emotionally and physically. So one of the things that green space does is that you know, there's, there's, there's so much evidence that illustrates that green spaces create mental and emotional health. You know, like I said, nature versus people like me, there's something really calming about fresh flowers, buzzing bees, and, uh, and, a, and a trickling brook, right? And there has been numerous studies done by, by geographers, by social scientists that illustrate this. Moreover, green spaces provide communities particularly communities that are grappling with higher crime rates, poverty, and other forms of instability, places to gather, to, be, to, to build community, and to organize. The other thing that green spaces do, particularly agricultural spaces, is they provide a ready and available source of affordable food. Chicago has one of the highest rates of food insecurity in the country. Chicagoans, most Chicagoans on the south side live more than a mile away from a grocery store. A mile. In some places, it's almost two. And this has deep and profound implications in terms of the health and stability of these communities. High rates of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. <laughs> are well known in poor communities all across the country, but specifically in poor working classes, uh, communities such as those on the south side of Chicago. But when you have a affordable, readily available source of food production in your community, it makes it easier for people to gain access to them. One, two, it also enables for them to learn how to incorporate them into their diets, to cultivate them, to grow them. And all of a sudden, all of this knowledge begins to be produced and reproduced within these communities. So my suggestion is this. Instead of having developers come in and put up Starbucks and beer gardens and coffee houses, which has been done in this community. These housing projects no longer exist. They were torn down in 2007. <coughs> and the 40,000 people that lived in these and the other housing projects have been displaced across the city. And they have been replaced with Starbucks, condos, <coughs> beer gardens, and all the accoutrements of gentrification. One way poor and working class people can fight back, push back against this, is to become architects of their, their own communities, to reutilize the spaces of disadvantage and exclusion and marginalization, and to create landscapes that feed the body, feed the mind, provide recreation, and demonstrate that poor and working class people do not need developers to transform their communities, that they can do it on their own. Yes, jobs and education no doubt are important, but that poor and working class people can, on their own terms, transform landscapes of carceral power landscapes of exclusion and poverty into spaces of fertile ground. And that's my time. Thank you.